Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you live here from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live in St. Paul, Minnesota at SPNN. And folks, boy, it just keeps coming. Uh, the threat of your liberties and your liberties are being eroded each and every day in our country. And this last week um, was not good uh, for liberty issues. And <clears throat> I'm going to start out in the number of the issues we're going to cover, but just a quick one here, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, which I was just out uh, in Spokane a little while ago, uh, about a week ago, but city officials have laid down the law to Christian pastors within their community telling them bluntly via an ordinance that if they refuse to marry homosexuals, they will face jail time and fines. The dictate comes on the heels of a legal battle with Donald and Evelyn Knapp, ordained ministers who own the Hitching Post Wedding Chapel in the city, but who oppose gay marriage, uh, the Daily Caller reported. A federal judge recently ruled that state's ban on gay marriage was unconstitutional, while the city of Coeur d'Alene was an ordinance that prevents discrimination based on sexual preference. The Supreme Court's recent refusal to take on gay rights appeals from five states has opened the door for same-sex marriages to go forth. The Knapps were just asked by a gay couple to perform their wedding ceremony, the Daily Caller reported. On Friday, a same-sex couple asked to be married by the Knapps, and the Knapps politely declined. The Daily Signal reported the Knapps now face a 180 Day jail term and a thousand dollar fine for each day they decline to celebrate the same sex wedding. Uh, serious business here. So, at least in Idaho, Coeur d'Alene, uh, federal rulings, uh, the city council there has, is coming after religious liberty, something ingrained in our United States Constitution the freedom of religion. Not freedom from, freedom of. And um, with the with these type of things, see, this is the whole purpose of the Oberfell versus Hodge, the same-sex marriage thing going on in the United States Supreme Court. The hearing that just took place. the The goal is not to have same-sex marriage. The goal is to destroy religious liberties and to destroy liberties. Uh, so that's the end run for gay people to tell you how to live your lives and force you to embrace their behavioral choices be, and force you to embrace their lifestyle. Uh, so, and the other thing the Constitution was about was freedom from government intrusion into religion and in religion. And this is, uh, this is as big as an intrusion as you can get. Uh, and this is serious stuff, um, I, I, I'm just afraid it's going to boil over uh, to out, out, outright war. Uh, but here, here's the reason. The, the, all this stuff has been developing in the civil and family law courts and in, and in the cities and in the tax law uh, where we have gone away from individual rights to collective rights. We've gone away from uh, individual liberties to uh, liberties of groups of people. And <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the tax laws, you're forced to associate w with people that you have no interest in associating with, such as pro football teams, such as community centers, such as, um, oh, you, you, you name it. Uh, anything the government is telling you you got to pay for and that you don't participate in or attend, uh, you, you have to, you know, you got to pay for it. So whether it's the twins, you know, and so this, the groundwork has been laid. Uh, so the, the reality here is um, what uh, people have been saying and uh, various articles. Basically, Christians should expect to be treated like first century church um, was treated in the past. In the, and the Christians should be expected to be treated uh, now 
it's now, it's happening now. Uh, it's not in the future. Uh, it's happening now, like the first century church was treated. So you go to uh, Iran, you go to Iraq, um, and all these other countries where Christians are being beheaded, and even in Minnesota where they tell parents you can't teach your children the Bible. Uh, so it's happening all over the place. Um, so this is just another step down that road. And um, we'll see where this case goes with the Naps. I think it's a good case that the Supreme Court might overthrow. However, I don't think so. Uh, over, overrule on because there was a decision in the U.S. Supreme Court that came up um, this week. Let me well, I, let me see the date here if I can find that. Yeah, yesterday. A huge, 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 significant decision, and this decision was called Williams Dash Uley, Y U L E E versus Florida Bar. And uh, William Julie was a judge, or was an attorney, I, I don't remember if they're a judge, but they're running for judge, and in Florida they elect judges, as 39 states. And uh, so, in order to promote public confidence in the integrity of the judiciary, the Florida Supreme Court adopted a judicial canon, an ethics canon, 7C. Uh, subsection 1 of its Code on Judicial Conduct, which provides that judicial candidates shall not personally solicit campaign funds, but may establish committees of responsible persons to raise money for elected camp election campaigns. Now, if any of that sounds familiar, we've had Greg Wurzel on our show, who's ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court, and he was told that he couldn't talk about issues. And he couldn't campaign. And he did anyway. He couldn't get endorsement from a political party, which, which he did. And so what happened is our board on judicial standards went out and then filed a complaint against him and sanctioned him and tried to. And he fought it and lost every single level, didn't get one vote on his behalf until he got to the United States Supreme Court. And at least this is my understanding of it. He didn't get a vote. But at the U.S. Supreme Court level, he ended up winning five to four, saying judges have free speech rights. They, if they're getting elected, they can talk about issues, and they can get endorsed just like anybody else can endorse. Anybody else can endorse a judge, so can a political party. And so whether you like it or not, Okay, you have free speech. If you don't like free speech, that's, I mean, we're in a world of hurt because then you don't get it. But you do have free speech to say that you don't like uh, judges having free speech. You get to say that, but then figure it out. Don't complain when someone takes away your free speech. But here, this one related to money. So uh, you can watch my past show with Greg Wurzel, and if you want to see past shows, go to youtube.com backslash speechlessmn, where Greg was on the show and explained the situation. But what the courts then did to him was, uh, and, and the, um, they changed the ethics that, okay, uh, obviously the Supreme Court says you can campaign, but you can't ask for money in groups of less than 19 people or 20 people. Uh, so if he wanted to ask money from his wife, he would have to bring 19 people into his bedroom and ask for and, and make sure they're there in order to ask for a contribution from his wife. <laughs> okay? Um, th this is how ridiculous it is. Well, here is the financial end of this case. Uh, and it's another five to four decision, and we can bring up the graphic there. Chief Justice uh, Roberts is the first one under our uh, speechless things. I think it's number eight. Or uh, Chief Justice John Roberts there ruled with the majority, uh, saying that Florida's interest in preserving public confidence in the integrity of its judiciary is compelling. The state may conclude that judges charged with exercising strict neutrality and independence cannot, 
implicate campaign donors without dismissing public confidence in judicial integrity. Well, here's the problem, Mr. Roberts. There is no integrity in the judiciary right now. There's no integrity because you cover up. You don't even let cameras in the court. Oh, did we get to see the hearing? Did we get to watch the video of the hearing that you had, Judge Ro Justice Roberts? No, we didn't get to see it. Did we get to see the, the hearing where uh, the deputies in Dakota County said Judge Knutson uh, issued an oral warrant? Did we get to see that? No, we didn't. Did we get to see the judge cover up and say, oh, we can't have David Knutson come in here and testify, Judge Knutson, because he's got this immunity, you know? Oh, really? Well, he just been implicated in committing a crime, violating the law, okay? But he doesn't get a chance to defend himself? Oh, we can't see what happened in the courtroom with uh, uh, Don Mayshack because you destroy the, you won't give the videos out of all the videos. I mean, you should hear these police officers get in there, testify. It's all right for us to lie. We lie all the time. You know, I mean, that's why there's no confidence in the judiciary because you cover up for yourselves and you, and you uh, protect yourselves when you sh don't need protection. And the people need to see what's going on. These are public trials, and we have freedom of the press. And this is the way to get a trial out so it's more public. And that's why people don't know what's going on. Okay, and they have to watch my show to have a little bit more in depth about what's going on in, in the courts uh, and in these cases. So um, this here, this decision is a sea change in the way a, a sea change of liberty. In other words, the integrity of the courts is more important than freedom of speech. That's what they said. And the dissenters in this case really uh, leveled that issue. All right. Uh, so that gets us then to the uh, Oberfell versus Hodges uh, case, the gay marriage case. Of course, there's no video on that, a lot of audio. Uh, but the main point here I want to make on this, uh, this case was that... Um, Coeur d'Alene has already made the decision. Coeur d'Alene has already come to the conclusion that the courts are going to come to and that you, do not longer, you no longer have freedom of religion. Okay, And pastors, you have to marry gay people, and your religious views can only be views. You cannot exercise your religious views uh, and opinions, and you have to be you are being forced to associate with activities that you don't want to associate with, and behaviors you don't want to associate with. It's another form of rape. It's a, you know, you, you, you want to you, you get these liberal people saying that if a husband has sex with his wife, it's always rape. You know, uh, this, is, this is far worse than that, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it, it's a form of molestation. It's a form of taking away freedom. This isn't, isn't um, um, this isn't a uh, this isn't a small deal uh, that's going on here. This will fundamentally change our country uh, big time. So we're not going to play any audio. Uh, I didn't set up any place, and and I don't have any video, any fancy uh, pictures for you to look at where the audio is going. Uh, but it's a it's a big big issue. Um, I want to remind you this is a call in program. So if you got comments or questions, call in six five one seven four seven three eight three eight. And also, uh, if you don't want to call in, speechlessmn at gmail dot com. Uh, you can uh, give comments there or suggestions. I just want to thank the people that do write in and, and uh, have given their support. I appreciate it uh, very, very much. Um, I'm going to switch the subjects a little bit, but they all tie back in uh, here. And there was a death uh, on the light rail this morning. Uh, it's very sad. 
and uh, I was a member of the Minnesota Senate, an employee of the Senate. Excuse me, I'm about ready to cough here. Uh, did you see that good warning I gave for the soundboard? Um, but anyway, uh, very tragic. And I'm on the light rail a lot. I'm on the buses a lot. And just with the light rail, it's just very dangerous there. Uh, people goofing off, people not paying attention. Uh, even though the trains blow their whistles and they're loud, you can't hear them. I mean, you hear them, but it doesn't register. Uh, people routinely see a train on one side. Okay, the train's there and they cross the track and they don't look the other way, or they look the other way, but the train's coming from the other direction. They see a train there, so I'm going to look there, but the train's coming from here on the other track. And unfortunately, uh, word is that a person was distracted, um, and, and it's too bad. But unfortunately also, oh, it's just going to be a lot more of this over the, over the years. Uh, they're just not, just not meant to be and shouldn't be when we have a bus system that is so much more cost effective, so much versatile. The light rail was shut down for an hour today. You know, with a the bus, they get another bus out there. Pick the people up and then move on. Uh, or another one is already on the route to come. Light rail, it's shut down both directions. Uh, and then people, there, there's no other light rail that's going to come and take you down the same path. Now the light rail does have 16, and the, uh, the green line, the blue line, um, uh, you know, they have, they have to scramble and get some uh, buses going. Uh, but it, it just isn't the same thing. So, uh, and I've been sat waiting 40, 50 minutes when there was an accident I had another death. Uh, that took place and there's no notice you're standing there and you're going when is it now that they've changed that you know they do ha they have I don't know after I complain they got the signs up not that I'm saying that that my complaint made an issue but they got signs up saying when the next train is coming and uh, uh, so the reason I bring up light rail is because we're gonna we're gonna switch here to Maplewood um, Actually, I'm going to talk about one other issue uh, before we get into Maplewood and the citizens' presentation and uh, developing property. Just unbelievable uh, the way citizens are treated uh, in Minnesota or in, in Maplewood. Um, but I've covered the Sandra Grazini Rucky divorce case, the missing children. Um, Michelle McDonald running for the Minnesota Supreme Court, who was the attorney, pro bono attorney for Sandra Grazzini Rucky, and um, got a number of, of videos that you can go and look in the archives at, on YouTube, backslash speechless MN, and McDonald. You can watch those videos of Sandra Grazzini Rucky where the story gets told, um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, there's not enough time. Uh, but for some reason, and I don't know why, ever since Michelle McDonald filed her federal lawsuit, and I have that here. Here it is, sorry. <clears throat> this uh, federal lawsuit against Judge David Knudsen, and we played the press conference on the show uh, last week uh, of that. Ever since that press conference and ever since this filing of this court case, suddenly people are paying attention and there's been a whole bunch of articles in the Star Tribune. Michael Broadcore has written some articles. Uh, Brandon Stahl for the uh, Star Tribune has written articles. And bloggers, are, a couple bloggers are starting to write articles. and. <laughs> And they're all feeding off each other, you know. One's got a little bit here, one's got a little bit there, and they're feeding off each other rather than really having a conversation with the participants in this. And it's hard to now because of all the federal lawsuits, because of all the um, events that have taken place that these people 
Now that the Lakeville police comes out and says they're persons of interest, Michelle McDonald and uh, Sandra Greene Rucky are persons of interest for the missing children, um, they have a responsibility and they have a right to shut up and not say anything. Uh, because these people, these police officers, and Lakeville in particular, if you go back to watch my show with Troy Moldy and what the Lakeville police officer did to him and, and broke into his house because uh, the door in his garage, what they couldn't see open, was his garage door was open. So they walked into his house. You know, <laughs> now you'll see the whole story there. Uh, and then they covered up for it. But the real issue that uh, he was going through a divorce at the time, and his ex-wife worked for the uh, uh, Lakeville Fire Department, and she knew some police officers, you know, and, and other fire, and was having a number of affairs and stuff like that. Troy's a fantastic man. Uh, children adore him, love him, a great father. And he was just getting creamed. And so Lakeville does not care. There's something going on in Lakeville, that in the police department, that is really, really fishy, really, really bad. And so you have uh, the, the big issue, none of these, none of these articles have talked about the biggest issue in this case, that these kids were threatened over a phone by their father and six gunshots went off, one for each child and Sandra. Okay, they were threatened with gunshots over the phone. It's all recorded. I, and I just don't remember if I played it on this show or not. Uh, but I've heard it. Uh, if you guys remember whether we did or not, uh, remind me. But I don't know. Uh, we didn't play it. Well, we'll get that played. <laughs> I have it someplace. I don't know why I haven't played it. Um, but that was presented before Judge David Knutson. And guess what? Oh, no order for protection. I mean, uh, un unbelievable. You know, and so, now, Judge David Knutson is a Dakota County judge, but th this happened, and so Lakeville's in Dakota County, and so th the police officers, wh what are they doing? And so they're saying, and so Sandra goes to them, my kids are missing, and what do they do? Nothing. So now that the federal lawsuit made the press and that the Star Tribune is, is looking into this, now the Lakeville police officers, according to the Star Tribune, uh, uh, starts making some statements, starts talking to some people. But all they have is excuses beforehand because they haven't interviewed any of these people as persons of interest. Um, and according to the Star Tribune in a Facebook post Wednesday, Lakeville police said, you would think people would want to cooperate, including attorneys and local television reporters who knew where the kids were, but that is not the case. We cannot force people to talk to us who have retained attorneys. Somehow certain people have forgotten that these kids will never have their children childhood back again and have no remorse for taking it away. Um, you know, here, here's what's, I mean, there's truth in that, in, in the aspect of kids won't have their childhood back. But remember, this happens day in and day out in our divorce courts with these, uh, with these judges who care nothing about parental rights who only look at the dollars they can gain with these attorneys that only look at the dollars that they can gain off the case. They care nothing about the kids. And instead of a judge being a shepherd, you know, as we heard about on last show with Michael Dittburner, Dittburner called judges sheepdogs. And those are warriors. And those are, uh, those are sheepdogs who go out and kill people. You know, <laughs> and so... You, you think this is the only case that these kids will never have their childhood back again? Uh-uh. This happens all the time. That's why the Lakeville police didn't do anything about it. Oh, it's a divorce case. Kids are missing. Somebody's got to know. We're not going to look into it. You know. Uh, 
And what, and what happens in these cases is children voice their opinion and, and then they run and then they leave because they know something's wrong, they know what's wrong, what they've experienced. Now, not all the time, though. Sometimes children are brainwashed. Sometimes children are, are told things that aren't true. They're based their information off of what they've been told. You need to be afraid of your daddy because he does this, this, and this, whether it's true or not. You need to be afraid because, you know, and so, uh, you know, I'm leaving your dad and he's yelling at me. He's mean for yelling at me, you know, for destroying our lives. You know, so therefore he hates you, you know. And so kids will run because of that too. But the court does not handle these things properly in dealing with these things. And when you get a judge like David Knutson, who, uh, I don't know what's going on in his head. I've never seen anything like him as a judge, issuing oral warrants, uh, telling a telling a uh, attorney that uh, she's going to present her case even though uh, it doesn't have her client there and, and the court told the client to go home, the case was over. You know, I mean, it's so convoluted, but um, there's so much not said in these reports that it's, it's really bad. Um, and you're not getting the whole picture, and the picture that you are getting uh, is is distorted. Um, so I'm going to find something here real quick. Um, somebody made made a comment. Yeah, <clears throat> if you read these articles, you should be able to make a get a picture that something's not right. Um, and you'd really have to read between the lines, you'd really have to pick it apart, but uh, why weren't the girls afforded an investigation when they told about their dad, you know, when the courts were told that the dad was uh, shot the gun over the phone? Uh, why was there, I mean, it's just bizarre that nothing would be looked into. Um, who did the police interview uh, to date? They didn't interview Del Nathan, uh, according to these articles, who was in, was in a car with the girls, one of the last persons to see him. Um, what great lengths have they gone to, pr to provide due process and safety and find the girls? Uh, what about the prior order for protections that were issued against the father? Uh, the divorce was over when all this started happening. Uh, the father threatened the daughters with killing her and her brothers and sisters and mother firing uh, his gun into the voicemail. Uh, are the Lakeville police covering up for the father? Are they affiliated with drug dealing that's uh, been taking place? Um, well, that's something the press hasn't covered. Uh, of course, I'm the press here. <laughs> I've covered it. Um, were the police angry the girls got the media attention when the investigators refused to take a report from them? I mean, you got girls with testimonies that are old enough to be able to articulate their experience, and they refuse to take a report. Child protection refuses. To be involved. Uh, it's just bizarre beyond all levels and the behavior of David Knutson is bizarre beyond all levels and it, they, he expects not to get caught. He expects everybody to cover up and so far what the media has done in these articles is they have exonerated the judge. They have not looked into his behavior. Not one of them has said he's issued an oral warrant, which is illegal. And and two, uh, they have not looked into the behavior of the Lakeville police. They haven't asked questions. They ask questions of, oh, these are persons of interest, you know, here that we got. Oh, maybe they did something. Well, maybe the Lakeville police did something. Why aren't they people of interest? They may know something that's going on and, and they're covering up. So, 
There's a lot of maybes, but not enough of them. All right. Okay, believe me, I'm going to bring this all back together. We got some video here. Uh, M Maplewood. Uh, this is, believe me, this was all tied back in together. Had a hearing, had a city council meeting two weeks ago on the 13th, and they were talking about a development, a potential development that they were going to approve. And this is a, a building that has all kinds of government funding. And a couple people got up to object, Bob Zick and Mark Bradley, and they got treated really bad. Uh, and, but you just got to see this whole thing to understand that the Maplewood City Council was providing a dog and pony show. And they got caught in so many contradictions, and we're going to show them here. And we're going to bring them right back to the Supreme Court issues uh, today and the light rail <laughs> and the Grazini Rocky case. So <clears throat> uh, let's place the first video here with Bob Zick saying why he thinks this development is a bad idea. The first is Bob Zick. So Mr. Zick, if you could introduce yourself for the record and your address, uh, and you have three minutes. Absolutely, Mayor. I am Bob Zick. Uh, Member of the press, uh, Inside Insight News Hour, cable channel 15, Wednesday night, 8:30 to 9:30 p.m. First of all, this project, uh, frame construction, is probably the cheapest thing you can build. Uh, we're talking about a conditional use permit here tonight. I call this project uh, Maplewood's own Cabrini Green Government Housing Project. The uh, Sherman and Associates, uh, look at all the government money in this, federal, state, county, Met Councils, city, TIF. Does, does Sherman and Associates have any skin in this game? Or is this all government money? Uh, this uh, housing project, Section 8 and Section 8 Hybrid, Section 42. There's no senior housing component of this. This was brought up at the Planning Commission. Along with the uh, proposed transit uh, line out of St. Paul, which would be along the current Vento walking trail, this will be a conduit for St. Paul's worst element to come to Maplewood. Similar to the blue line that brings all the gangs and that cause the chaos to the Mall of America that we all hear about. Maplewood is flooded with group homes, shelters, subsidized housing, substandard housing, um, housing for uninvested residents. That's what Maplewood is turning into. Uh, first, the council should outright reject this project. But if it goes ahead, and I am totally against this. There should be the conditional use permit should include 24 hours of uniform security at the on site at the building. Security cameras outside, inside hallways, in elevators, extra security lighting outside. Uh, that uh, the city should back charge to the to the building, not to the residents, because most of these residents won't have the resources to pay for these services like uh, police, fire calls, especially ambulances. And we know that Maplewood what, writes off about a million dollars a year in non-collected ambulance uh, charges. Um, you know, the question is, how, how does, when Maplewood hands out these TIFs like this, how does Maplewood make the uh, the school district and the county whole, um, yet alone the city. Make sure there's a security bond, that this is probably the most profitable part of the development, that there's a security bond in place for all these other issues I brought, but also that the rest of the development goes ahead and that they just don't back away from this. Um, you know, I look at this last statement here, when we build all this high density housing, subsidized housing, and I don't even care if you, 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 you put in senior housing, 15 years down the road, 
what are we going to have? We're going to have all this high density housing, and where does it, what does it turn into? Look at St. Paul, three look minutes. at some of these you cities. Could wrap up, please. Yes. We are creating a monster here with this kind of housing. There is no end to it. And uh, at some point in time, this is going to come around, and we're going to have all this blighted housing on our hands. Thank you, Council. All right, uh, in control room, go back to the very beginning of that and play the very beginning again. You can hear Kathy Juneman do her sigh. Okay, I want to point that out. Okay, go play. Here the first is Bob Zick. <sighs> okay. So, Mr. Zick, if you could introduce yourself. All your right. Uh, and then did you hear the piece of paper ripping <laughs> while he was speaking? All plans to distract him uh, while he's speaking, unfortunately. He can't hear anyway, so I won't distract him. <laughs> uh, um, he was very accurate in a lot of what he said uh, there, but he brought in the light rail, Section 42, and he asked the, probably the most important question, does Sherman developers have any skin in this game? Okay, where's their money on the line? And... All this is going to turn back, and of course he said he does his show on cable, so you want further comments, come back here. This is another big issue that's going to be a hot button for the city council. Watch my show so you can find out more information, okay, because I got three minutes or four minutes. In, in that case, he had four, uh, but usually three minutes, sometimes less. Okay, so you want to be in depth. Now, mind you, remember, the city council has their whole show. You know, and they can replay it over and over again as many times as they want during the month or during the two weeks or whatever. They can keep playing it, all right? He's got two minutes before the council. Now, he does have a show, uh, and he can spend more time on his show, but what he does on the show, he gets to do, okay? And, and they're like, no, no free speech for you. Uh, oh, you get an hour show. Oh, no, my goodness, what are we going to do? You know, well, come on. Get real here. Okay. So let's go to Mark Bradley, the next one, and he hear what he has to say. And then I left my piece of paper on the with the uh, my agenda there, if you can bring that out during the clip. All right, let's play Mark. Mark Bradley, 2164 Woodland Avenue. And I find this abhorrent, this whole plan, because the fact is right now you're jacking up my taxes at a time when it's spo you're supposed to be flush. Most cities are actually reducing taxes at this point, but you guys haven't done it. Instead, you're going to be going after us again. No, you're not going to go after 3M because they're too big. You're not going to be going after any other industry because you haven't gotten any industry in here. The sad part about this is that it's irrelevant and it's really insulting to me because the fact is you're saying, okay, we'll take in more welfare and more welfare. Well, let's understand, number one, this 50 units is a small slot, but basically uh, they're telling you everybody is not going to be paying for their units. Even the ones at the top aren't even paying for the full cost of it. Now, where are you going to get your taxes from? You've got to expect you're going to get them from some person that's already going to be negotiating a deal for you to give them a, a, a special cut rate because of their welfare. Let's understand, this is welfare in its grossest, most abhorrent weird way. And the reality is here, if you're talking about millennials, no millennial wants to come here. I have uh, a son who's just graduated from North High, and uh, his friends there in Tartan and in North High say they would no way want to live here because this is a ghetto right now. We are a ghetto and we're building a bigger ghetto because of you've been buying into the Kool-Aid. Hey, Jim Jones, you got your, your uh, new, new, new group right here. You're selling us down the street. And any Maplewood resident who'd buy into this thing has got to be drinking the Kool-Aid, too. This is absurd and un irrational. Where are you going to get your tax base? Tell me, Melinda, where are you going to get that tax base? You tell me, too, Nora. You're going to sit there think to yourself, ha-ha, I sold another deal down this drain. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. But the sad part about it is you're selling all of us residents who are paying most of your wages. And it's sad. And it's irrelevant. Quite animated there, but very much right on. And whether the city council likes it or not, the tax base and the taxes are going on to the individual 
and the developers, uh, the people living in these units uh, are not adding to our tax revenue. Uh, we've given that away. And so like we were saying with 3M, with their tax increment financing for the new building, uh, it's, it's given away. And what are you doing for the individual here? You're just raising their taxes. Okay, and he's got it right. He knows what he's talking about there, all right? So, um, and, and the other thing that's going on, not, and, and the only reason this housing is going in here is because they want to put a light rail or um, some transit on, on this parkway, on this uh, roadway right by there, and they need to have high-density housing. And in order to... You know, I, I'm on the Hiawatha. They, they got all kinds of these developments that are, and, and commercial developments that are sitting empty for years now. They're sitting empty. They don't have people in them uh, because there's too much of it. But it had to be built there, uh, and it's the only way it could be built because of the way these laws and the financings are passed. And we're going to get that into a little bit. But here, uh, we got a caller on the line. Caller, you got a comment or question? Yeah, Tim, Rich Newmeister. Hey, Rich. Howdy. I just, uh, just a comment and just a perspective because I've been seeing, you know, I saw in your show now and then Bob Zick's uh, Insight, uh, Insight, Insight, whatever. Sure. It's Something like that. Uh, about, you know, the ability for the public to be able to talk to elected officials at public hearings, whether it be school board, legislature, whatever. Right. And I just want to say it's, it's for those cities that don't have it, it's important to have. You know, I really miss the city of St. Paul uh, used to have that. And, you uh -huh. know, and for those people who may know, uh, ever heard of Mayor Charlie McCarty, Sharon Skrilla Anderson and yeah. other people, you know, they would come down and make their points. And other people, it wasn't just people like those two I just mentioned, but anybody could. Yeah. And many times uh, it was a good way to get an issue ignited. And and right. for Charlie, he used that to run against the city establishment in the in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and he won. And but now, I mean. Throughout cities, local cities, they're just as blessed and less, from my viewpoint, trying to quell uh, the public <clears throat> in St. Paul uh, for public hearings on an issue. It's basically 15 minutes on each side. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you're an individual or just one or two and you're not familiar with everybody or whatever, right. you're squelched. Right. And, and that's one of the things that... <clears throat> On last night's Zix show, yes, yeah. about this this lady that served as a parliamentarian or whatever I forget who she is, but she picked the people right to speak on an ordinance right, and I am just uh, surprised at that. I mean, shocking. I, I mean, it runs against all perspective. It's 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 the government deciding who's to speak, right? And, you know. I've never seen I've never seen that before at the legislature yeah. where you know as you know the city clerk <laughs> okay well something you know someone should question that you know at the Absolutely. legislature as you know anyone can testify which is great right and you would think you on the local level you would have there would be more flexibility than at the legislature <laughs> it's the other way around right. anyways I just wanted to make a comment well, very good comments, and, and you're you're very right about your observations. So I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for calling in. Uh, so right on. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. Uh, you can have your name down to speak, but if you don't get called on, or if you're the fourth person on one side of the issue and there's three on the other, uh, you know, you're, you you may be the out person. It's just totally arbitrary. Um, so it's a bad deal. These guys have been discussing how do we deal with that. And they even said they've been discussing how do we deal with this. And, and, and the answer is you let people have their speech. Let them have their say. Big deal. Get over it. I mean, you get to speak on hours on end, you know, and just let them have their three minutes. Come on. Big deal. 
get over it. I mean, grow up. All right, uh, let's let's go on to the next uh, video here. So let's see. Let's start to talk about Mr. Zick, who always comes up and never gives his address and tells us how he's a member of the press and advertises for his show. Let's see. What did he have to say? Sherman Associates, what's your uh, value in this? I think it's about $12.5 million. Is that correct? Uh, Shane LaFave with Sherman Associates. Uh, yes, Mayor, that is the total development cost of the project, okay. about $12.5 million of phase one. Yeah, okay. So that's what you have into it. Is that regardless of the government investment and so forth, uh, grants? Uh, $12.5 million is, is the, the total development cost, including all sources of funds and um, for all the uses, all the acquisition, construction, um, all the soft costs, architects' fees, um, all of those things. Okay. So our contribution um, w with this project uh, is in the form of a deferred developer fee uh, equity, and that's a few hundred thousand dollars. Can you tell us about the, or Melinda, is that you, that would tell us about the um, funding the, from the Met Council and the grants and all of that? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, as uh, most of you remember, we submitted a grant to the Metropolitan Council in which we were funded $1.9 million. Um, and the, we're spending $3.5 million on public improvements. $1 million will be taken by us to spend on those improvements, and the, the rest will be going to the developer for land acquisition. And as they indicated earlier, the property has been closed. Um, I'd also just like to note that the adjusted rents with that first project are based on gross income of the people who live there and they'll be sliding depending on their income level. 30% of the norm or the average uh, income in the, in the neighborhood and I think it's 10 units are going to be set aside for veterans. So when you look at that and the average rents that will be collected and paid by those residents there, that all of even the lowest rent that will come in, uh, those for the veterans, is still a higher rent than the average for the Gladstone neighborhood. What about the taxes, Ms. Coleman? Are these people going to pay taxes? They are most definitely going to be paying taxes, and they're going to be paying a lot more taxes than the vacant parcel, the Maplewood Bowl structure. Uh, this will be a huge increase to tax base for the city. So let's see, $12.5 million in investments. We have veterans that are going to come in, and we know our veterans are coming back mm -hmm. from you know, Iraq and places like that need a, need a place to live. We're going to have higher rents, and we're going to have a better, we're going to have an increased tax base. And we're kicking off a redevelopment plan. And we're kicking off a redevelopment plan. So I think uh, when you listen to both sides of this, and there's a narrative here, there's one side that wants to be outraged, and then there's sort of the facts. And then there's the facts. All right. Did you see how that, how Mayor Slawak got totally debunked? You know, like, hey, developer, man, you're putting money into this, aren't you? You know, developer comes back, we got nothing in this, nothing. We got deferred equity, meaning we get a percentage of ownership when this thing sells, but they're also getting property maintenance uh, management fees um, and uh, income off of uh, investment dollars raised. In other words, this is a, uh, there's 9% in tax credit. So out of that 12.5 million, 9% is that is tax credits, which is going to come to around 1. Point, uh, um, we'll say what, we'll just say $1.2 million worth of tax credit. So they can find investors that will invest a million, about around a million dollars in over 15 years They'll, they'll end up getting the tax credit part of it, and so will the developer get part of that tax credit. So they'll end up having nothing into the program over 15 years, but they put in upfront money, and the, and the investors can pay over a period of time, uh, you know, paying in a five- or seven-year time period. And so their money gets, their, gets their tax credit over a given number of years. So it's as if they have nothing into the program. So uh, Bradley was right. I mean, and and Mayor Slavik is wrong. These people have nothing into it except future money and tax credits up now. So this is a big, big savings for them. And um, you know, the only thing Maplewood gets out of this, 
Matter of fact, Maplewood gets nothing out of it. There's a $12.5 million development that 15, 20 years down the road, uh, when the tax credits are gone, can be sold then. Uh, and, and then it can be on the tax rolls. So, I mean, that's my understanding of how this works. And I used to sell these type of things uh, in, in the past. So, one, one, one million from the Met Council, Maplewood gets to, to develop roads, uh, infrastructure. One million the developers get from Met Council for whatever property development. 250,000 from Ramsey County. 9% in tax credits from the investors. TIF proceeds and environmental cleanup funds. That's what they're getting. Uh, it's just amazing. I'm gonna, let's go to the very last video and play the address issue that uh, Slawick was talking about about Bob and Bob addresses that issue and he's Bob is right on this and Slawick is dead wrong uh, so again she's wrong say okay. your name and address for the record good evening again mayor council education for the mayor why don't you ask developers that come here to enrich Mr. themselves Zuck, what's your um, address mayor I will get to that Please, please be polite. We ask everybody to please, have their name Mayor, and their address. Why don't you ask the developers that come here to enrich themselves where they personally live? Mayor, there is no requirement for the press to state their personal address or anyone else. For your information and knowledge, I do have financial property and business interest in Maplewood. Thank you, Mayor. I know it's hard for you to get your wrap your mind around that uh, first of all I want to here, start Zick. by you know they, they can have rules all they want but the rules are unconstitutional and have no bearing on who gets to speak you know uh, they all know where he lives okay I go up there I never give my address but I do write it down for them on the sheet uh, uh, sign-in sheet you know but the reality is anybody can speak at any government meeting because they all take federal funds. All the cities, all the schools, they take federal money so you get to speak because you live here and are a citizen of this nation. That's the bottom line. Do you need an address to verify that you live? In, that's what it used to be, to verify that you live in the community so you can say something. doesn't apply anymore. Okay, and the Supreme Court has rolled that, that out. Okay. Um, Let's go to the hope one here. Uh, this is a response to Mark Bradley's comments uh, about how great uh, Bradley's saying how bad of a deal it is. Slawick's going to say it's a great deal. You know, Mr. Bradley, I think it was Mr. Zick that said we're creating a monster. We are creating hope here. This is hope for our community. It is not a monster, and to think that, that it's a monster is crazy. So we are creating hope. That's what we are about. Okay, here's what it comes down to. Okay, Maplewood, Nora Slavic, you're not a pastor, you're not a church, city council, that is not your job. Okay, your job is not to create hope. Your job is to protect the citizens of the community provide for the common good, which means if you do something, everybody benefits from that. And that's why the community center does not work. That's why this development does not work and will not work, because only certain people are benefiting from it. Okay, and you're giving away other people's tax monies for things that they cannot gain from. Okay, hope for communities. No, just possibly the poor people getting the lower cost. Okay, but that's not your job to do that. And that's why our nation is in a, a heap of trouble because of these federal tax subsidies when we don't, federal government doesn't have the money. Okay, and people are going to do fine. They're going to figure out. Investors are going to do fine. They're going to figure out what to do and how to make it. But they're not going to, but by doing it on the backs of people who receive no benefit from that is, is just wrong all the way wrong. All right, let's watch the next clip. We're running out of time. And so I think it's important, you know, that the, that the public 
uh, be able to hear the facts. And I hope our folks that have their cable shows out there are present both sides on those as well, because we know uh, they certainly should, uh, just like they like to present their facts here, we hope they prevent, present our facts there and what is accurate. All right, uh, that's not the one she blew up. Presenting facts, really? Uh, you were presenting facts and you got it thrown back in your face that your facts were wrong, twice. Okay, so I hope you present accurate facts. You want to come on the show, tell your story? You're, you're more than welcome to. All right, you, this is our venue. We get to say what we want. It's your venue. You get to say what you want. And you get to say that we're not telling the facts right, and we get to say you're not telling the facts right. And I've already showed you two examples where you weren't telling the facts right. All right, I don't remember which video I had of uh, Nora Slavik blowing up the mayor, just screaming. Uh, I don't remember which, but we're, we're kind of out of time. Here's the deal, folks. The light rail, a boondoggle, the housing development, a boondoggle, um, those are coming together. The forced association, Maplewood Community Center, lack of free speech. Judges can't have free speech. It's all falling apart, folks. Ministers are going to go to jail because of what they believe and are forced to do what they don't want to do and against their religious uh, views and lives. We're in a world of hurt here. People, good people need to stand up. And if you're not standing up, you're not a good person. All right. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. You said to me that you wouldn't leave, but now I see that you're lost. Sets on fire